Hello, Bible students, and welcome to the Sunday Evening Bible Study. I'm Dr. Renee Milton, and this week we're going to study Ephesians, the first chapter. But before we get started on that, for those of you that are just joining us, whenever I start a new book of the Bible, I try to go over a quick general lesson of how to study your Bible. When we start a book of the Bible, we want to know three things. The date it was written, if we can assess that from various sources. The context in which it was written, meaning the situations that were going on during the time of the writing. And we want to see if we can determine the initial audience it was written to. This is very important when we do what's called exegesis of the scripture and go down through the text to objectively reach the truth of what is being taught. Before we move on, a couple of housekeeping things that I want to cover is having proper resources to study the scripture. Now we can all read and enjoy the Bible and get a blessing from the scriptures as God talks to our hearts, but study is another matter. The Bible tells us to give good application or study or to be diligent, to show ourselves approved to God as a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Many in good faith, and this is mostly in reference to the King James Version, will run to the dictionary when they see an obscure word they don't understand. A word of caution here with the English dictionary as a resource when you're studying King through the King James Version. Using an English dictionary to define biblical words is just scratching the surface in understanding, and it can be downright misleading sometimes. We certainly don't want to be misled in understanding the will of God for our lives. A good example of this is Hebrews 13, 16. The King James Version of the text says, to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. The word communicate in its present day sense means talking, to converse with another person. In this passage, the word means to share your goods or your money with others. He's referring to giving. I have to admit I've made the mistake at one point in my life in thinking that he was talking about talking. So another example, is Matthew 13, 21. The King James Version text reads, Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. By and by today means after a while or after a space of time. But if you look at the original language, the Greek word euthos is used which means immediately. And in other verses, that word is translated straightway or immediately. But here they use the term by and by, which is a completely different connotation for us in the 21st century. If you just love the King James Version, that's fine. I love it too. And I grew up using it and still use it in my preaching, but you have to be careful. Now, not that you need all of these following resources for our studies, but if you plan to do deep study of the scripture, the following are good resources, whether you are a new convert or even a pastor. Besides the references in our favorite Bible translation, whatever that may be, the King James Version, the NIV, take a look at an interlinear New Testament. Now, what that is, is the New Testament in Greek and the English is placed there above or below the original reference Greek words. There are also interlinear Old Testament Bibles as well. Now, if you use an interlinear, don't let the Greek writing scare you. This can still be a valuable resource for particular words and gaining understanding of the original intent. Or you can see if any word was even written in the original text there at all. This sometimes happens because Greek does not translate directly to English word for word. 
Then there's the Strong's Concordance, which you can get online or at your local Bible bookstore. And it has every word in the Bible. And in the back, it has the Greek and Hebrew definitions of those words. It's pretty simple to use, but it is a huge book in the hard copy. But thank God we have online resources today. I want to give you some of those online resources. Bible Gateway and Study Light are both kind of the same. You can look up passages of scripture, check out the Greek, Hebrew, and the parallel translations of various scripture. Biblehub.com is also another one that is like that. And also at these sites, you have numerous commentaries online that can give you additional insight and opinions on various passages. But of course, to keep from getting too confused, always pray before you study so that the Spirit of God will speak to you and lead you in the correct path. Now for our study of Ephesians, I'm going to use the King James Version and I'll only bring in another version if necessary to help explain the meaning of the text. Let's briefly go over the dates and background. Ephesians was written around 60 or 61 AD they were written after Paul's missionary journeys and while in prison in Rome. There are books and books on whether this letter was actually written in Rome and actually written by Paul, but we're not going to go over all of those details here. Just to let you know that there is scholarly controversy if you care to dig into that. Regardless of all that, this is the inspired word of God, and so we'll leave it at that. But we know that this third missionary journey lasted from 53 to 57 AD, and he was sent to Rome to be tried as a Roman citizen. He was imprisoned for two years from 61 to 63 AD, and they believe he was released around 63 AD. And then he was re-imprisoned and martyred in 67 or 68 AD. This letter was distributed to the Ephesian saints by Tychicus, as stated in the last chapter of the book. Ephesians is one of the captivity epistles. Those epistles include Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. It's pretty unique in that there seems to be no particular occasion or purpose for this letter. So the purpose of the writing is not really clear. He does not address any particular false teachings and stays with general themes like unity, Christian living, and the Christian home. It's also unique because of the general nature of the letter, um, meaning it, it seemed to be meant, uh, meant as a circular letter for all of the churches in the city of Ephesus. When we look at Acts 18 and 19, we see the beginnings of the Ephesian church. Acts 18, verses 18 through 28, Paul, along with Priscilla and Aquila, preached the gospel there. Paul starts in the synagogue and was asked to stay, but he declines and leaves the husband and wife to continue teaching in his absence. This is why we find Priscilla and Aquila uh, there to help instruct Apollos more perfectly in the preaching of the gospel. Paul returns and teaches for three years in Ephesus. Now, the Ephesian situation was a, it was a touchy place to evangelize. This was one of the largest cities of the Roman Empire with 250,000 residents. You have magic and the worship of the goddess Diana, which is uh, the Latin name for Artemis, which is the uh, Greek god that was worship, worshipped there. The temple to Diana was considered one of the seven wonders of the world. Diana, or Artemis, was a huge deal in the ancient world. She was considered the mother of the earth and the mother of all life. A lot of scholars refer to Artemis Ephesia as the goddess that is worshipped here. Different from other goddesses 
uh, other parts of the ancient world also named Artemis. The idea being for her that she embodied the re reproductive powers of men and animals and her statues have rows of breasts to symbolize life and fertility. <clears throat> and she was thought to help women with childbirth. The priests of her temple were usually eunuchs and the priestesses were virgins. And there was a part of the religion that involved temple prostitution, although that has recently been debated. The rituals of the temple were feasts and processions. She was considered to be everywhere there was life. So the idea was to make shrines to her and carry small statues of her. And the idol makers would make these shrines and small representations so that worshipers could take these things with them wherever they went. This would have been a difficult situation for evangelizing. Ephesus was the world center of the Artemis cult and the city had become extremely wealthy because of this. Worshippers came from all over the world to celebrate Artemis here. It must have been like trying to shut down football in the middle of a Super Bowl. The whole city worshipped this goddess, but Paul and his companions got the gospel across to enough of them that it caused a problem. People began to be converted to Christ from this religion. And the city was so impacted by this that the sale of idols dropped off and the idol makers rioted against Paul, starting to affect their money. The next time we see the church in Acts, the 20th chapter, Paul makes port at Miletus. And so he sent for the elders of the church who were at Ephesus to come to him. So Ephesian Christians were a people under great pressure as they were in direct opposition to their surrounding environment. So this would have contextual implications for letters written to Timothy, who Paul left there in 64 AD to govern the churches. There are five recorded instances that we see uh, about Ephesus in scripture. Apollos is trained in the gospel by Priscilla and Aquila in Acts 18 verses 24 through 27. The sick were healed by Paul through handkerchiefs and aprons in Acts 19. The seven sons of Sceva failed to imitate Paul casting out demons and prompting further belief in the gospel in Acts 19. And magic books and scrolls were burnt totaling one million dollars in um, our money today. Demetrius incites a riot against Paul in Acts 19, verse 23. So we can see many miraculous things were done to help the people of Ephesus believe in the gospel. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Just to focus on several points in this first six verses, Let's look at who Paul is addressing. Paul establishes himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. He doesn't point to his great exploits or how mightily God has used him, but he points only to his calling as an apostle of Christ, and therefore his authority comes from Christ. 
I believe he is just trying to address his position as God's apostle. He says this is by the will of God the Father, the first person in the Godhead. So he is letting them know that this was the plan of God the Father, that he be an apostle. Then he says to the saints and faithful, Note that he uses this term to live people, people that are living. Saints simply means those that are set apart for God and faithful. Faithful meaning that they have continued on in the life of salvation. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Saints and the faithful are all the same people, just a deeper description of who they are. All saints, all Christians are saints and all saints must be faithful and holy down here on earth or they will never be saints in heaven. A little about the term at Ephesus. Okay, folks, so here we go again. Don't roll your eyes into the scholarly discussions again. Some scholars point to the fact that the very original text did not have these words, and so therefore this may have been a general circular letter. This is just something that some scholars point to as additional evidence that this may not have been directly to the Ephesians. The concern comes up, and it's not an unfounded concern, but it comes up because Paul has spent two years teaching here, according to the scriptures in Acts 19 and 10, I think I said three earlier, but it's really two years he spent teaching here. And for having known these people so well and having founded this church, the tone of the letter seems to be kind of impersonal. There are no salutations to specific people here at all and no references to his presence here. Hmm. So this just is something for a very interesting discussion. Now, verses four and five tells us that holiness was God's plan before the world began. Since the foundation of the world, God wanted us to be holy. God's plan was that he would have a holy people and that we as his saints would be a people that were without blame, meaning without moral fault, without willful sin, spiritually blameless, and of course, This only comes from walking in the spirit, blameless. So you get the point here. It is possible to live holy and blameless because that was God's original intent for his new peculiar people. This new nation that was prophesied would be born at once. And you can see that prophecy in Isaiah 66 and 8. This is something to consider for those that take the name of a believer in Christ, but whose lifestyle doesn't match the profession. It was God's will that we be holy. For those that think it's not possible to live holy and blameless, consider this particular scripture that we're discussing. God says it is. And in fact, that it was his divine plan that we live this way. In love, He predetermined or predestined us to the adoption of children. Predestined simply means foreordained or decided beforehand. Not who would be saved as individuals, as some may believe, because God would have all men to be saved. But he planned the adoption of us, meaning mankind, as sons and daughters by Jesus Christ. Through Christ, We have received this privilege to be a child of God, and this was his divine plan. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. 
in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. It is in Christ, in verse 7, that we have redemption. It was through his blood being spilt on the cross that we have forgiveness of all of our sins. And it was the great grace of God that brought the entire plan of salvation to us to buy us back from the power that sin had over our lives. Verse 8 has two points. First, this word referring to grace, abounded, is often translated lavished. So we get a better picture here with that word lavished. So his grace was lavished on us. When something is lavished, there's an abundance of it. There's lots and lots of grace that God put into our lives to live for him. If you don't have enough grace, there's more where that came from, a fountain of it that he can bestow on us. Point number two, this plan took wisdom, this verse says, and prudence. We kind of use these words interchangeably today, but Paul is conveying in the original language two thoughts. First, wisdom, which is the Greek word Sophia, which means insight or divine intelligence. And then there's the word prudence, which is the Greek word phronesis or phronesi, which is practical wisdom or understanding that leads to right action. So what is this saying? Divine intelligence created the plan of salvation and it was prudence, which was the divine skill to execute that plan. Isn't that an awesome concept? If that is not glorious to anyone else, it's glorious to me. I could shout right now. Verse 10 and 11. In these verses, Paul makes it clear it was God's divine plan. He tells us the dispensation, fullness of time, that God had to reveal his will so that he would bring together all things in heaven and earth. God's original inheritance was just Israel, but now it's wider and includes the Gentiles. This shows that in God's eternal mind, the church existed before it was an actual creation. The church of God, people who are saved from all backgrounds, would be one in Christ. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So verse 13 is a continuation of his thought in verse 12. The people who first trusted in Christ were the Jews. So in verse 13, he says that you also trusted in Christ after you heard the word of truth. And after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, what is he talking about here? Remember in Acts 19, there was a group of believers at Ephesus that had not received the Holy Spirit. He recounts this in this verse by reminding them that after they were, after they believed, they were sealed. In the ancient world, when something was sealed, it was a declaration of ownership, a legal signature. It doesn't mean something sealed or closed up. He continues with this legal reference in verse 14, 
saying the Holy Spirit is the earnest or legal pledge of our internal inheritance, eternal inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession or until the owner comes to take possession. We're very familiar, many of us, of putting a down payment on something uh, to hold it and put a pledge out there that we want the property and uh, then uh, when we are ready to take possession, we can take possession. So this, in a sense, in a legal sense, is what God did. He sealed them. He put his legal signature on them with the Holy Spirit, and they became God's possession. And he, the Spirit is also uh, the earnest, the legal pledge that we are God's possession. And when he comes... He is going to claim his possessions. He's going to take ownership and of those that are saved and living holy lives in Christ. In verse 15, uh, some make an issue out of this, I heard of your faith, as if he didn't know them. There are some people that um, say here, see, this is proof that um, maybe this wasn't written by Paul because he doesn't seem to know these people. However, I would bring to your attention that remember Paul is writing this from prison. This is one of the captivity epistles and it is very likely that people kept him informed of how well the Ephesian saints were doing and he's simply referring to that. Verses 16 through 18 are simply a recounting of the details of his prayers for them. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The amazing thing about these last verses is how Paul exalts Christ and not himself. Throughout the first chapter, he talks of the plan of God brought to us through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. In verse 20 here, he especially mentions how God raised Christ from the dead and the elevated position of Christ at the right hand of God. Now watch here, Paul references the heaven where God is and is going to reference another type of heavenly place in chapter 2, so stay tuned. Verse 21 through 23. This has a very significant truth. There is no person on earth that exceeds Christ. He is the head of all things for the benefit of the church when it says to the church. There is no earthly person that we should ever place above Christ. In the church, he is the head over every position, every title, every authority. Christ alone is the head and we are simply the body. Now, if the body is disconnected from the head, it ceases to be the body of Christ. So this analogy has good implications when we're talking about being the body of Christ. We must stay connected to the head. Thank you for joining us today at the Sunday Evening Bible Study. Uh, we've had a big surge in subscriptions. And so if you haven't subscribed, it would be great if you hit that subscribe button now and you will get notified of every new lesson that is uploaded.